Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Ashu. COVID-19 has placed many of us in scenarios that we are unaccustomed to. Things like being low on resources, whether that's PPE, testing kits, medications, access to consultants, ICU beds, ventilators. These are all things that we have had to become accustomed to not having. And yet there is an entire population of emergency departments that experienced this long before COVID-19 ever hit. And that's emergency departments in rural America. And so adding a pandemic to rural emergency departments seems like a completely impossible scenario to navigate. So today we're sitting down with two of our colleagues, rural emergency medicine experts, Dr. Harry Wingate and Dr. Ken Gramick, both of whom are members of the American College of Emergency Physicians Rural Emergency Medicine section and have taken the time today to share with me and with you their experience in rural America. So gentlemen, would you briefly tell us who you are and where you currently practice? My name is Dr. Harry Tripp Wingate, and um, I practice rural emergency medicine for the past 30 years. Joined ASAP in 1999, so I've been a member for 21 years and um, have enjoyed that. It's been a great opportunity to network with colleagues and, and uh, really hone my emergency medicine skills. Uh, I got involved with the rural section um, about uh, 12 years ago and uh, served a two-year term as the chair of the rural section. So uh, that was, again, a great opportunity to meet a lot of like-minded uh, emergency physicians. Currently, I, I live in Athens, Georgia, and I'm a site medical director, a small uh, ED, uh, part of the Tanner Health System in Wadawi, Alabama. It's just over the Georgia-Alabama line. And we are a uh, single doc shop. Um, Pre-COVID, we were uh, about a 13,000 ED volume, seeing about 30 plus patients a day. And uh, post-COVID, like everybody else, our volume has significantly dropped. Do have a little bit of uh, eight to 10 hour uh, double coverage with uh, nurse practitioners. But we also have kind of a hybrid model. So we uh, oversee uh, inpatient service, swing bed, uh, general, uh, medicine patients, but we don't have an ICU, so it's it's more like a critical access type hospital. I'm Ken Gramick, and I'm been a practicing emergency physician for 30 years. I was residency trained and ABM certified in emergency medicine. Um, worked in some suburban and urban academic centers for about the first third of my career been practicing rural EM for more than 20 years uh, now. I uh, moved uh, to Sandpoint here, which is in North Idaho, uh, a little more than 20 years ago and founded a emergency medicine uh, independent democratic small group. And so we're one of the few small democratic uh, groups that has survived. And we have a primary critical access site here at Sandpoint that we serve primarily and then we supplement staffing it to other regional critical access hospitals. ED size here is basically we have eight bed ED plus three vertical beds, uh, about a 10,000 annual volume and it is located in Sandpoint, Idaho, which is a beautiful part of northern Idaho in the Rocky Mountains, about 50 miles from the Canadian border, uh, 75 miles from Spokane, Washington and has a rural population of about 45,000 people. In the last two years, I've been uh, uh, currently a, a, the section chair for rural emergency medicine. Great. Thank you both for taking the time to talk with us today and share your experience. Now, let's start with Dr. Wingate. Tell me what your volume and experience has been like so far with COVID-19 in the Georgia, Alabama area. Uh, you know, there, there are hot spots. Uh, one of the hot spots in the rural areas is Albany, Georgia, which is where I grew up down in southwest Georgia. And, and there, um, it, it made national news. They had a, an individual, sort of an index case, a fellow that came down for a funeral, and he was sick at the time uh, that he attended the pre-funeral festivities and, uh, and infected a lot of people 
and he, he had the next day he had to miss the funeral. He had to be admitted. And then no one at that time was so early. No one at the time knew exactly what was going on. So there, there weren't the precautions um, that we take today. And so a lot of the staff got infected, including the pulmonologists that took care of him. They took care of him for about four days and uh, he was from Atlanta. So they ended up, he got worse. They ended up transferring him to Atlanta and that's where he was tested when he uh, returned back to Atlanta and tested positive for COVID. But not, <laughs> not until he had infected a large number of people and really set off a large wave of infection down there. They just now are starting to kind of get their legs underneath them and, and be able to manage it. But they were overwhelmed down there. But most of Georgia, most of rural Georgia has been sort of a similar experience that we're seeing in, in rural Alabama. And that's, you know, sporadic cases. And Dr. Gramick, for you in Idaho, similar? Idaho has only had 2,300 cases so far with about uh, 72 deaths. Uh, our county has only actually only identified four cases and we've had no deaths. Um, but our, our county is, um, is it's sort of a more of a resort town destination. We have a ski hill that's 11 miles away from us, and then we have a large lake, Lake Pondere, which um, we have a lot of uh, tourists and uh, summer visitors there, cottage people, snowbirds that come back to the area. Um, and so we were very concerned that um, we might be hit hard by community spread of this disease, uh, like had occurred in other areas in Idaho. Okay. Now, Dr. Wingate, in your area, you are covering both the emergency department and the intensive care unit. What does that look like during a COVID-19 pandemic? Are you admitting all those patients? Are you having to transfer many? What's your practice been like? Yeah, so, yeah, so that's a good question because, you know, these small facilities, the size that I work in, they don't really have even if they had ICUs and had some ICU beds, they, they really don't have the staff and specialists to really manage a ventilated COVID patient. As you know, if they have to go on a ventilator, they're pretty sick and they require all kinds of special uh, uh, procedures and draping and filters and proning and a whole bunch of, of techniques and tactics that you're just not going to find regularly practice. So what we have done, this is, you know, Part of the insightful leadership at Tanner is that they have designated our facility, since we're the smallest of the four facilities, as the COVID-free facility. So we don't admit uh, suspected COVID patients or persons under investigation. If someone is sick enough to require supplemental oxygen and we suspect it's a COVID patient, we, we will transfer them to our mothership hospital and they have a, a dedicated COVID wing uh, that they will admit them to. And if they need to go, you know, to the ICU, they've got a COVID prepared area to, to handle all the COVID patients. And being at a non-COVID center where you're having to transfer patients out, are you required to test somebody before they can go? Or is this purely based on clinical suspicion? It is based on clinical suspicion because, it, you know, as you know, testing um, the testing for the antigen uh, PCR, it, it, our, their fastest turnaround time is four days. But if they're not sick enough, they don't require oxygen and they're not sick enough to be admitted. Um, if they didn't have any other comorbidities and it was just sort of an uncomplicated flu type picture, we would tell them that, you know, there's a possibility they could have COVID they need to isolate themselves you know, for the next 14 days, assume that they have it, and if they get worse, come on back, because there wasn't really at that time, there's not really any uh, specific therapies um, that we could begin if we knew for sure it was COVID. Uh, we just we, you know, make sure it's not other conditions, because other things like COPD and CHF and heart attacks and all, all those, uh, emergency medical conditions don't go away just because we're in the middle of a, uh, of a um, viral epidemic. 
Dr. Gremick, in Idaho, you have also seen some changes and had to restructure some things for your rural practice. Tell us how COVID-19 has impacted you. So we, um, uh, th- probably the first week of March, we, we basically uh, ramped up uh, all of our changes that really affected both our, our use of PPE and precautions in the emergency department um, as as well as our our ED operations and flow, um, so I think one one of the advantages of being a small organization is your ability to respond a little bit more quickly also to these kinds of crises. Um, we reduced our shift hours to shorter shifts and canceled our vacations and travel. No one was going anywhere, so we ended up doing more shifts and shorter shifts and had the ability to do that. But we had to really redesign our whole ED operations and flow. We had to control hospital access, screening, uh, all people coming in emergency into the hospital, change visitor policy to allow no visitors and surgical masks for all patients um, that were being treated. And basically closed our waiting room too, which was a, which I think a lot of uh, emergency departments have done. Now, tell me, Dr. Gramick, has your experience been similar to Dr. Wingate's? I mean, you're up in Idaho, but you're also in touch with people through the ASAP rural EM section. And are you practicing in the same manner? Do you have the same constraints on ICU beds? And are you having to transfer patients as well? So so practicing in a resource-limited environment, this is something that affects all rural hospitals. So Typically, you're going to have a very limited, uh, either very limited or sometimes no ICU capacity. Uh, Many critical access hospitals may have zero ICU beds. Some have maybe up to four ICU beds. So when it came to a, 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 a pandemic like this where patients could be critically ill, requiring intubation and ventilatory care, uh, most hospitals would be transferring all of their critical care patients and anyone that was intubated would likely be transferred to a regional center. So uh, there's likely not to be any intensivists available at uh, um, at a rural hospital. Um, so uh, even if you had, you know, patients that could be vent- intubated or on ventilators, uh, limited resources for who's going to be managing those intubated patients. Um, so that, of course, impacts sort of the other impact is then transferring those patients out to regional ICU bed. Um, and the, the, the capacity of the regional system, if it's experiencing a surge, if you're transferring them out, obviously affects the ability for them to um, get a bed and accept those transfers. So and where you're practicing, has there been any discussion about trading patients? You know, as you send a COVID patient, if the transfer center is full, maybe they can send you someone else back to your community in exchange? Um, we, we actually were involved in some discussions regarding that. It's fortunately never gotten to that point. But what we were thinking about doing was if we, if we had to transfer a, a, a significant number of patients to the regional center that maybe perhaps then we could take back patients that were maybe non, non-COVID and, and lower acuity. Now, it seems as though the majority of emergency departments in the U.S. actually experienced a significant volume decrease during this pandemic unless they were in one of the urban centers where there was a large outbreak. Has that been your uh, experience collectively, both of you? Correct. Yeah. And patients tell us, you know, we're just afraid to come to the emergency room. And so much so that I think that's the biggest part of the volume reductions. A lot of the uh, what we always complained about is, you know, urgent care, or primary care type cases. People are in some serious cases, people are self-selecting to stay home. When that's where, you know, from a business standpoint, that's where our margins are. <laughs> and so it's hurt our company. And, uh, you know, uh, we're financially tr- trying to deal with this like everybody else. I know these small hospitals uh, are hurting as well. 
you know, we've had since 2010, we've had uh, 130 something rural facilities close. And in 2020, pre-COVID, there were already eight that were scheduled for closure. So when you take out someone's outpatient uh, services, you take out, uh, reduce their ED volume by 50%, you're just gonna stress them to the point where they, if they don't have a large uh, mothership like we do, or they don't have a county government that's willing to subsidize them then financially, they don't have any option but to you know, file for chapter 11 or be bought by somebody. So. Uh, we're yet to see how this is going to play out, but I would imagine it's going to um, further reduce the number of rural facilities that we have. Uh, they mentioned the number 2,000. Um, that's probably fairly accurate. I think there are a little less than 5,000 acute care uh, facilities in the country, and uh, almost uh, 35, 40 percent of them are be classified as rural facilities. So, so it's a big group, and often forgotten and overlooked uh, part of the system, but it's out there. Yeah, well, there. I think there's been, it's been a huge um, uh, change. Uh, I think particularly during the, the whole nationwide lockdown period, uh, we experienced the same kind of um, sort of voluntary reduction in the volume of ED visits and in probably 20 to 30%. And, and we also, you know, saw, what other people are seeing with this decreased visits for STEMIs and strokes and times trauma and, and so forth um, as people were either uh, either avoiding the hospital or, or, or <laughs> uh, in some cases, maybe trauma, we, you know, the, the MVCs weren't happening because people weren't driving as much perhaps, but about 42% of the hospitals in America are actually rural or small hospitals and they account for about 17 percent of all nationwide emergency visits uh, with all these hospitals uh, basically canceling their their elective procedures and surgery based and uh, shutting down a lot of their services that were previously available I think it's um, going to have a huge economic impact on the sustainability of those hospitals. And Dr. Gramick, what have you seen in the way of response to these drastic volume decreases in uh, rural hospitals? Yeah, so so in the I think immediately when we went into this new mode of the pandemic, uh, the, the hospital coinciding with with the uh, reduction in, in elective services, they basically furloughed a lot of uh, nursing and providers uh, and, and uh, healthcare workers. Uh, and then um, now they, it's kind of transitioned to some, into some layoffs as, or um, firings or terminations as well. So I, I, I think, that this is probably not unusual and uh, for other rural hospitals and the question i think will be as they re as they kind of reopen up if you know what services are they going that they once had are they going to reestablish versus decide that it's they just can't uh, provide those kinds of services and that's a critical point because in the rural communities, you're providing health care to people who are quite far away from an urban center. Uh, Dr. Wingate, in, in your Georgia, Alabama area, how far is the nearest next hospital? Uh, yeah, we're, we're right in the uh, epicenter um, of uh, four major communities all about 45 minutes to an hour away. So we, we really are the uh, in the northeastern part of Alabama um, in sort of an isolated area. It's beautiful country, uh, lots of rolling hills, kind of at the uh, beginnings of the foot of the uh, uh, Appalachian mountain range that starts in northeast Alabama and runs up through the northern part of Georgia on up into Tennessee and North Carolina. So it's, it's beautiful country. But it's still very, very rural, very agricultural there, um, and uh, uh, not a whole lot of healthcare resources for the folks. 
Now that's an hour's drive for the patient, but what if you're having to transfer someone? Now you need a EMS unit or an ambulance to take them. What's the county ambulance staffing like? Yeah, you know, it's like a lot of these rural uh, counties, you usually have one service that covers the county. And um, uh, we actually have two services. They divide the county up uh, into to almost halves. But um, uh, they do have, uh, you know, a limited number of units on. So a lot of times transfers do get delayed because of logistics. They just don't have the, uh, don't want to leave the county uncovered for 911 calls. Sometimes we have to, if we can fly, we'll utilize the helicopter services to, to help, you know, keep the county covered. But it can be a challenge, and that's a, that's, that's a part of one of the challenges of being a rural EM doc pre-COVID and, and during COVID. Uh, fortunately, with the COVID patients, we do have an agreement with our um, uh, hospital, within our hospital system, so we don't have to fight, you know, to get people transferred. If they need oxygen and we suspect they're COVID, they're going to they're gonna take the patient. And for you, Dr. Gremick, how remote is your location? You know, certainly there are places that are much more what I would call frontier emergency medicine. I mean, uh, you know, other where they really have, they're really isolated. I mean, we, we actually probably an hour by ground, basically, we could get someone to uh, a regional level um, hospital and some of some additional um, services, maybe an hour and a half away. So we're kind of right on um, the edge there in terms of uh, our location and getting people in a time sensitive fashion to higher levels of care. Okay. One more question for the both of you. Looking at telemedicine, there's been a big increase in that in the entire nation with the COVID-19 pandemic. Is that something that both of you are utilizing now in a more robust manner than you did previously? Yeah, we've been using iPads. Um, you know, this that's one of the uh, aspects of, of medicine technology that's being accelerated right now because uh, CMS, you know, has waived a lot of the issues, regulatory issues surrounding telemedicine. So, uh, and, and, you know, a lot of facilities are seeing that it's helping not only keep the staff and patients safe, but it's decreasing the amount of PPE that's necessary, uh, you know, having to change PPE in between uh, visits with patients and things. You can now do telerounds and things like that. So I, yeah, I think that telehealth has has huge potential, and it's always been a, a huge potential. It's been used in rural places. Some rural places are having more robust systems pre-existing than others, but we we certainly have kind of done our own sort of local telehealth type of uh, implementation. It's really helped us in the emergency department with uh, the ability to, and and that really helps us on conserving PPE. So we would use either uh, two-way radio communications or uh, basically a, like an iPad with two iPads uh, with um, FaceTime. Uh, so we could communicate with nurses that were in PPE, that were outside uh, screening and maybe testing, swabbing uh, sus suspected uh, patients for COVID. Uh, we could also do that inside with the nurse inside an isolation room if they were caring for someone who um, was a person under investigation and uh, we were suspicious that uh, they may have COVID disease. Uh, so that way we wouldn't have to use quite as much PPE in terms of, you know, going in and out of rooms and, and so forth. So it's, it's really helped us on, on that level. Um, and then I'm sure that, um, uh, you know, the, there's been a, obviously a huge uh, increase in its use, even with the local clinics and, and doctor's offices so that they can um, um, communicate with their, their patients without them being in the um, office or in a waiting room. 
Well, thank you both for taking the time to talk with us about some of those challenges that you experience in rural emergency medicine. We have all experienced some of these, like the problems with acquiring enough personal protective equipment, but some of the things we don't think about are transport times and access to EMS to move patients and how the financial impact of COVID-19 is affecting the overall health of a hospital, especially a critical access hospital that is already financially constrained and has extremely limited resources. So thank you to you both for the work that you continue to do in rural America. And thanks again for joining us on the podcast. And thank you for listening. As always, if you have comments or want to reach out to us, dial the phone number and leave us a voicemail or use the email included in the show notes. I look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, I'm Sam Eshoo.